welcome to History Hack. If you didn't know by now, we are the revolution. That means we're sharp, witty, lots of fun, but it also means that we're essentially the peasants in Les Mis huddled round a table in the corner of the bar with no money. If you enjoy the show, please do support us. We have a Patreon account by which you can donate a small monthly sum in appreciation of what you're hearing. Alternatively, we have Ko-fi, in which you can just do a one-off donation as a thank you if you particularly enjoy a certain episode. Either way, we massively appreciate all of your support. Hope you enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to a very special episode of History Hack. Since I've been doing this more regularly, there has been a lot of requests and pleading and begging and screaming and crying and then finally demands that there be a monthly naval episode. And eventually I said, all right, Alina, fine, I'll do it. No problem. At the moment, it's unnamed. I'm not very good at naming things, which is probably a good thing that my ex-wife actually named my children. Otherwise, they would be one, two and three or Sean Hoss, Nyes now and Victoria and Louise. But I'm not here alone as I'm on a bit of a cultural exchange. This morning I sat through and assisted with Jane Austen, of which I know absolutely nothing. And so I brought along Beth Wyatt to educate her in naval history. Hi, Beth. How are you doing? Hi, Chris. Yeah, doing well. Who have we got today and what are we looking at? Yeah, so our guest today is Alexander Rose, and Alex is a journalist and historian who has written the New York Times bestseller, Washington Spies, the story of America's first spy ring, which AMC picked up and made turn Washington Spies, as well as Empires of the Sky and Kings of the North. And he's here today to talk to us about his latest book, The Lion and the Fox, Two Rival Spies and the Secret Plot to Build a Confederate Navy. Hi, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me on. This book is fantastic. We're urging people to buy it at the end as well. This was something that I hadn't really thought about in context of the American Civil War. Everyone tends to think about the land campaigns. But let's set the scene. Federacy has risen. They've attacked Fort Sumter and started the Civil War. And obviously, the, the North holds the Navy. Why is this a big problem for the Confederacy? Uh, the reason is is, is the, the, the Union Navy, Lincoln's Navy, uh, which was not powerful by any means. It was, you know, on an absolute basis. I mean, compared to the Royal Navy or the French Navy, it was like a gnat. It didn't really, didn't really count. But it was a lot more powerful than the Confederate Navy, which at that time, at the beginning of the war, consisted of precisely one blue water ship. So really, there wasn't, <laughs> there wasn't a lot to work with. The danger to the Confederacy is that first, they have no real industrial capacity. They don't have the ability to build ships, unlike the North. Uh, second, the North is a major industrial power in and, in and of itself, and it has the ability to rapidly acquire or build ships of its own. So that Navy, it's a bit of a pipsqueak, can rapidly grow. Uh, now, the danger to this, the real danger to the South is that when that Navy, that Union Navy grows, it, it begins to impose or enforce rather, the blockade of the entire southern coast, all the way from Virginia, all the way down to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, now, since the South isn't really um, economically self-sufficient, it has to import and export um, in order to survive and in order to, um, you know, grow, or, you know, sort of improve its or strengthen its sinews for this for this war that is about to, that has just begun. So that's the real danger here. It's the danger of not a sudden strike. Uh, it's more of a, you know, like a snake's bite. It's more of a, like an anaconda effect. You're just going to be slowly strangled by the North. So the South has to break free of that grip. That's, that's, uh, that, that's its main, uh, you know, its main responsibility or task here. What kind of items are the, are the South in need of that the, the blockade is stopping? Uh, well, pretty much everything. Uh, it ranges from, I mean, they, they didn't need, they weren't even printing their own Bibles. They had to import Bibles to, distribute to their troops that's that's how mm. you know un self-sufficient they were i mean it was a kind of a backward rural society compared to the much more industrialized north now it doesn't mean that uh you know that it, that it doesn't have any industry at all it could build say a uh, railway or locomotives it could build a ship or two it but it didn't really ha it couldn't really expand past that um now this is a war that's broken out that is that is sort of uh, has elements of a modern war in it. It has railways and, um, you know, new, new types of weapons and all that kind of stuff. And it's a long, it's going to be a long war. Um, 
But the South does have one treasure. It has one big thing that nobody else has, and that is it has the world's largest supply of high-grade cotton, raw cotton, uh, picked in the fields by you know a massive slave labor force and uh, exported to mostly to Britain. I mean, the vast majority of it to Britain, which is the world's greatest importer and exporter of, of textiles at the time. Um, about 20% of the British economy or 20% of the people in Britain are indirectly or directly employed or dependent on the cotton industry. Uh, it's sort of one of those oft forgotten facts about 19th century Britain. Um, and so the cotton from the South can be exported and that will pay for all the stuff that the South needs in exchange. For instance, <laughs> basic stuff like guns. Uh, munitions, ammunition, uh, gun, you know, uh, you know, everything, artillery shells, um, everything comes in through that, through that passage, through that, through the Atlantic. Uh, but that is currently being partly blocked by the Northern blockade of the South. So in this story, who is Captain James Bullock and what is his mission? Captain James Bullock was a, was from Georgia. Uh, he was, you know, from an old, old line Georgia family. Uh, you know, fa- you know, kind of an affluent family, been over there for generations. You know, they don't, they don't slaves. Uh, Bullock himself didn't. He, he had left to go to a boarding school in the north when he was about 12 or something. So he never really, he, he was never really in the South much. And he goes directly from school into the U.S. Navy, the old Navy of the time. Um, and he becomes, he comes, you know, he's as an officer and he, you know, he rises up the ranks, but it's a slow, you know, it's a slow, greasy pole. And, um, you know, he but he gains a lot of experience in doing things like, um, uh, you know, navigation of coasts. He uh, learns how to construct and build ships, you know, using because which is an extremely, extremely complicated process through, uh, you know, in the shipyards. Um, and he eventually leaves the Navy, as many people did in the early 1850s. And he goes becomes a private mail mailboat captain. And he, and he does the run from. Uh, where he's based in New York and he goes down to Cuba and back and forth and so on. Um, and he makes a bit of money. Um, he's called up at the beginning of the war and he has to make a choice about whether he wants to, you know, stay as he is in the North or whether he, he will join the nascent Confederate Navy. Um, and he makes a choice for the South, even though, as he says, I don't have any property there. I don't have any. I don't have any interest there. It's just, I think it's like a, a romantic attachment to, you know, to the, you know, good old Georgia kind of stuff. Um, but and it, but he turns out he's a perfect recruit for the secret world of the, of, you know, to just kind of use an anachronism, the, the Confederate secret service. And that is, uh, he's clean. The North doesn't know about him. Uh, he doesn't, he's not involved with any skullduggery or anything. He is, but he is, a fantastic recruit. And so he gets sent over to Liverpool, uh, in England, obviously. And he, his job is to build, acquire, commission a secret Confederate fleet consisting of, uh, blockade runners and commerce raiders and ironclad rams, um, in order to fit out the, 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 the Confederate Navy. Uh, and that will, br- the, the, the real point being to break that blockade. And to destroy the U.S. Navy, so that's that's his that's his job from day one, and he 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 could just continues on it throughout the war. Yeah, he has quite a fascinating career. I, I won't drop too many spoilers, but it almost brings Britain into the war. Palmerston, the Prime Minister, says that the Royal Navy and Great Britain are in a position to to inflict a severe blow upon and to read a lesson to the United States, which will not soon be forgotten. So what kind of, I'm trying not to use it, I'm going to have to say at the midway vernacular, what kind of cock-ups cause Britain and, and the North to be on the brink of war? Well, what you have to understand is that the that Britain at the beginning of the war uh, was in a, in a kind of a tricky position. It was the world's hyperpower. Um, the Confederacy has a lot of friends in Britain. I mean, a lot of friends. Um, you know, the vast majority of the House of Commons, for instance, were very pro-Confederate. It's not because they loved slavery. They all kind of just thought it was one of these vestigial relics that would eventually disappear. Uh, um, but the fact is, is that the cotton is, cotton is, you know, is the, is the blood of the economy. You, and, and again, there's also a romantic attachment. You know, all these <laughs> Confederate plantationers were kind of misconceived 
as, you know, kind of these sort of, you know, aristocrats just like us, you know, big landowners, you know, um, good chaps all around. And, uh, so there was this, and so the Confederacy wanted to create, wanted to lure Britain into declaring for the South against the North in a kind of an Anglo Confederate, um, alliance, you know, and that would mean that the Royal Navy, for instance, uh, would attack the U.S. Navy and, uh, British soldiers could invade the North, uh, from Canada. I mean, there's a lot of, lot of, it was a, would have been a great move if you could pull it off. So the Confederacy's job is to pull Britain in. Uh, Britain is not a big fan of the North. It thinks they're a bunch of, you know, uh, tariff obsessed, uh, Bulgarians like, like Lincoln, who, who's very anti British, you know, anti British. So, so there's not a lot of friends there. And they were also big economic competitors as well. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're not stupid. Uh, and they don't want to be lured into somebody else's war. So what the British do is, is that they, at the beginning of the war, I think it's, I think it's Russell who says, you know, um, you know, there's this argument and there's that, that argument for and against going in, but for God's sake, let's keep out of it. So what, what, what Britain wanted to do was basically wait and see, like see who was winning and then <laughs> kind of, you know, support that side. You know, it's just, you know, power politics, the usual stuff. Good thing uh, we France, normally did. Yeah. France did exactly the same. It's, 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 you know, it's, it's sort of sensible, you know, it's a sensible diplomatic move. Uh, no, of course that annoys both the Confederates and it annoys both the Union because, at the, uh, you know, the, while they're not recognizing the Confederacy as an independent state, they're not not doing that either. Um, and for the Confederacy, they, you know, they, they were disappointed, heavily disappointed that the Brits hadn't come in for them, uh, you know, that just hadn't swooped in to save them. Um, so basically what you, what you have is, uh, a kind of a tense situation in 1861 between Britain and the Union. There's a lot of people agitating for Britain to declare war against the Union. And what it needs is a spark. And that spark is, is, is presented by, uh, Captain Charles Wilkes, who's a, a U.S. Navy captain, um, a, you know, really accomplished sailor, you know, like like Captain Bly. I mean, a, this guy sort of explored the the, Pacific, the deepest Pacific before the war and did an incredible job of it. But he was also a martinet who had a habit of court-martialing junior officers whenever they <laughs> disagreed with them. Anyway, he comes in the he's uh, sailing a frigate, I think, and he's uh, this is uh, and he comes across this is in uh, November, I think, 1861. Um, and he comes across a, uh, a British mail packet carrying two British, uh, sorry, uh, Southern diplomats called Mason and Slidell, who are being, who are coming to Britain on a British ship in order to try and discuss this alliance. Um, he says he declares them contraband of war and he takes them prisoner, takes them off the ship, you see, and, and, and runs off. This creates a colossal firestorm in Britain because what you have is this, you know, this, this, this impertinent, um, Wilkes fellow stopping and boarding a free British ship, commercial ship, and then kidnapping and shanghaiing two diplomats from a, a nation that Britain wasn't at war with. So this is, it's called the, the Trent affair because it was the, the ship was called the R, RMS Trent. Um, and the two sides, I mean, the, the, you know, in Britain, there's, there's like, Confederate flags everywhere. The, the newspapers are hammering away at the Union saying we need to go to war now. It gets all a bit jingoey, the whole thing. Um, pa, you know, Lord Palmerston from that quote that you just, you mentioned earlier is, is kind of getting a bit gunboat on this, uh, getting very you know, excited at, uh, in the, at, at this, uh, at this blow against, you know, a more proper, um, and, it's Russell along who kind of sides with Prince Albert, who's ailing at the time to sort of calm things down. And uh, they intervene with this and they come to an agreement that, you know, look, they talk to Lincoln privately and they say, look, just give back the two diplomats and kind of make an apology and we can make this go away. Mm. Because no, nobody really wants war. Lincoln, to his great credit, says, OK, fine. And he orders the release of, of, of the prisoners. He doesn't make an apology though. He doesn't go that, that far, but you know, Russell decides that he'll overlook, overlook it. And so peace is restored. It's, it's one of these, it's a great crisis. A great, the, 
but during it, the Confederates are over the moon because this is it. This is the great um, spark that will push Britain into war against the Union. This is what they've been waiting for. They're, 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 they're you know, happy as, as, as Larry about it. Um, but the Union manages, uh, as I mentioned, to sort of negotiate its way out of it. But what it shows is, is that, uh, you know, to, to, to Confederates and Union alike, that Britain has to be handled very, very carefully. And that it, it can swing either way quite violently. Um, and that means, and so that circum, um, that circumscribes the, the, the espionage war going on in Britain at that time between the Union and the South. They have to, you know, they have to sort of <laughs> curtail their activities a little bit because they don't want to start, you know, angering their, their hosts, as they say. Absolutely. And the Confederate agents aren't just smuggling and blockade running, but um, they're also commissioning warship construction, aren't they? Uh, yes, the, the, the Confederates had a three phase plan. The first was to uh, build a swarm of blockade runners. These were small, light, f- flighty ships uh, whose only job was to sneak in and out of southern ports, um, you know, carrying well, you know, they would say cargo, the Union would say contraband uh, of, you know, of cotton going out uh, and they would stop off at Nassau and uh, then transship to to a bigger ship going to Liverpool and in return bringing back in the munitions, arms, uh, all sorts of stuff coming back in, even, you know, drugs, you know, like laudanum for operations uh, in ether and so on for um, the, the, you know, the new uh, new surgery that was going on in the battlefield. Um, so that is, that is designed to poke holes and keep the, in the, in the blockade and to keep the, the South alive. Stage two was to build commerce raiders. And these would later become the, the famous CSS, Florida and Alabama and Shenandoah, but focusing on the Florida and Alabama first, their job was to go out there and just sink as many union merchant vessels as possible you know, sink their con- cargo. And the, the plan there was for, you know, to, to, to provoke Northern businessmen into pushing Lincoln to, into seeking an armistice with the South, a kind of a ceasefire. Mm. That's what the South wanted. The South didn't have to win the war. It just had not to lose it. And Lincoln eventually, well, this was the plan. And of course, Lincoln eventually would have to seek a kind of a, you know, a ceasefire, and then they would spend the next five years negotiating the, the border and slavery and all this kind of stuff. Um, and then the third stage was that if that didn't work, then they would send out two of the most modern warships of the time. These were ironclads. Uh, there was this was a great time of, of the transition from sail from wooden sail ships to iron steamships. Uh, and the, these things were, you know, they were a really advanced weapons platform. They had, you know, rotating turrets, uh, gun turrets. Uh, they had fixed, thick armor. And, uh, you know, most impressively, they had this gigantic ram at the front of them underneath the prow. And their job was to just go out there and ram, uh, U.S. Navy warships. I mean, basically drown them at sea. And that would, that would finally break the Union once they started really losing you know, their, their, their ships. That would be the end of the blockade. The South would be free to import and export and, and the, and the war could continue. So that was the essential plan here. Obviously that, that takes quite a lot of resources and it's not something you can secretly build. You know, you can't secretly have warships being constructed. And the Union, although I'm sure the Confederacy would have pre- pre- preferred that the Union were a bit daft and not really involved, they were involved and they have their own agents in England. How do they try to stop this building program and how successful because obviously Britain are trying to stay neutral and building warships for any side in a war is frowned upon and the British government were keen not to get involved so what were the union spies trying to do to stop it and how were they trying to convince the British authorities that this was going on and get them to stop it well the essential uh, problem facing you, the, the union in Britain was that for the most part until the ironclad rams came about uh, but that was significantly later in the war, was that these weren't warships. These were, well, you know, freighters, cargo ships. They were, you know, little pleasure yachts. I mean, you could, uh, you know, uh, sailing ships. You could disguise 
commerce raiders like the Alabama and the Florida and, and the blockade runners as just regular civilian ships. And that was part of the, the cleverness of the plan uh, that James Bullock, the Confederate agent, came up with, and that he was circumscribed by something called the Foreign Enlistment Act, which had been passed half a century earlier and that everyone had pretty much forgotten about. It had never been used in court. It had never been tried at all. And it had originally been passed uh, around the time of the Napoleonic Wars, just after the Napoleonic Wars, to prevent British volunteers heading off to, you know, join up with rebellions in South America, uh, basically mercenaries. Um, what everyone had forgotten was, is that it also had a naval section. And that naval section was very, very clear on that you are not allowed to build, uh, commission, uh, purchase, acquire in any way or equip or fit out as a, as a, you know, a, a warship in Britain, in a British, in, in British waters, uh, that was going to be used in a, in a, in a war in which Britain was not involved or against a power that Britain was friendly with. And Britain was friendly technically with both sides. That is a huge obstacle to building a Navy, uh, as you can perhaps gather. Yeah. And that's why Bullock read the, read, you know, he read, he read the legislation, he read the, the, the law very, very carefully, and he found a, a loophole in it. And that was, is that it didn't say that you couldn't build a civilian ship that was later turned into a warship. Mm -hmm in, say, neutral waters, international waters. So what he would do was that he would disguise these ships like the Alabama and the Florida, and he would, uh, you know, civilian ships, and there wouldn't be any armaments aboard, nothing. I mean, they were completely, you know, whistle clean. And, uh, you know, he would outfit them for long naval voyages, as you would do if you were a merchant. And the job, what he could do was he would also purchase an old tender, you know, an old freighter, that nobody would notice in, say, London or Glasgow or somewhere. Uh, and he would fill it with uh, the, the cannons, the, the armaments, all that kind of stuff, uh, which you could buy legally. You could buy it. You could, it's weird. You could buy the arms. You just could put them on a, sh on a ship. <laughs> uh, and so then the two ships would then rendezvous somewhere way out in the Atlantic, well away from prying eyes. And there the armaments and so forth would be transferred over to the civilian ship, which was always hidden under a, a different name. And then uh, Confederate uh, officers and, and men would come aboard and they would commission that ship into the Confederate Navy. And it would be, it would sort of emerge in the chrysalis as a, as this beautiful, uh, you know, brand new battleship or warship that nobody had known about. See, that's the game. So what the union has to do and, uh, the, the union effort was run by a man called Thomas Dudley. And, uh, he was this, uh, sort of modest, you know, he was the son of a sort of a modest Quaker farmer, very, very different from, from Bullock. Bullock was this dexterous, cat-like, sort of feline, well, fox-like of the, yeah. of the title, you know, um, you know, is, you know, he had a, you know, quite ironic, worldly, cynical, that kind of thing. Um, whereas Dudley lacked any discernible sense of humor whatsoever. And would, but he was a lion. I mean, he did, he was completely rigid. He was a, he, you know, he was an abolitionist, strict abolitionist from decades earlier. I mean, he used to, he used to go down south disguised as a, a southern slave trader and buy slaves and bring them back up north, which was, you know, a very dangerous occupation. You know, mm -hmm. it's very easy to end up on the side of a road somewhere and nobody finds out about it. You know, if you get caught, um, and he had gone over that he had gone over to Liverpool just by happenstance as the consul. You know, the low diplomatic position. It was just supposed to be there for a year. Uh, he pulled some strings for Lincoln and for the, for the election. You know, he's a sort of stout Republican. And, uh, and, uh, and he just happened to be there and he loathes Bullock. I mean, he just thinks he's the scum of the earth and he thinks the Confederacy is the scum of the earth and that he will uproot them and destroy them, whatever, whatever it takes, whatever it costs. Uh, and he sets, and he knows that Bullock is evading the law. He knows what he's doing, but he can't prove it. This is still a legal system. You can't just, uh, you know, Dudley cannot just point a finger at Bullock and go to the authorities and say, that guy is breaking the law. A, because he's not breaking the law. He's keeping strictly to the law. And B, you have to persuade, you know, the officials to act on this. 
it's not just, you know, it's like a, it, you have to collect a huge amount of evidence. You have to put spies into their shipyards, all of whom are working hand in glove with, with, with Bullock. They're all, they're all in the sort of cone of silence. Um, so what the, so what Dudley does is he has to acquire all of these affidavits and as I said, detectives and spies and he has to search around. And, and again, he's in Liverpool, which is a very anti-union city. So he's in a real hostile ground. Now you have to remember that Liverpool at the time was a heavily pro-Confederate city. When Bullock first showed up in Liverpool back in 1861, he said there was more Confederate bunting there, more flags in the streets celebrating the South than there were actually in the capital of the South of Richmond. So it was friendly territory to him. I mean, Bullock could count on all the shipyards, all the shipyard owners, uh, all of the politicians, all of the merchants, most of the you know, the sailors, you know, to kind of be on his side. It was this was this was going to be easy, he thought, building all these ships. And it was for a while until he ran into Thomas Dudley, the, the Union consul. And Dudley initially makes mistakes. I mean, a lot of mistakes. He's being run ragged by Bullock. Bullock is a kind of a, a magician. I mean, he can see round corners. He un- he pre- can predict what Dudley's going to do at any given time and take ev- evasive action. The guy has just is just this sort of pen and teller of 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 spies, and uh, Dudley can't work it out. Like he doesn't understand how he's constantly being outplayed, and so he makes mistake after mistake. But he recruits eventually. He wises up a bit, and that's part of the 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 the, the arc of of his character in the book, and that Dudley. Uh, you know, he recruits a, 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 an Irish detective called Maguire, who used to be on the police force, and now he's a sort of a, a you know a private investigator, um, you know, investigating, you know, tailing people for their divorces and so on. And um, but Maguire is the guy who knows his way around Liverpool. He knows the ins and outs. He knows the taverns. He knows how the place works. And remember, Dudley at the time is this nice local sort of conveyancing solicitor type from New Jersey he doesn't know anything. Um, and so he, so Maguire kind of serves as, as a sort of Virgil guiding Dante down through the inferno. And, uh, you know, over time, it takes a long time and he, he makes bad errors and he messes up and, uh, you know, uh, and Bullock, uh, you know, evades his snares all the time, constantly. Um, but eventually Dudley manages to bag Bullock. And, and sort of nail him to the wall. It's a kind of a mixed metaphor there. But, um, he, but he eventually manages to persuade the British to start investigating Bullock's, uh, so-called, you know, legal commissioning of this, of this Navy. And that's where, that's when they really start getting into this, you know, cat and mouse, this well, uh, cat versus cat, um, uh, you know, scenario where they're both trying to outwit and outfox each other. Something there slightly. I know that went off a little bit. Um, no, that, that that was fine. I think. I think that's, okay. Yeah. Did you have any other comments, Chris, or should I move to the next question? No, yeah, 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 you go for yeah. it. Go for it. Okay. <laughs> Great. And you've mentioned um, earlier in our discussion the Florida and the Alabama. Could you tell us a little bit more about how successful they were in these missions? Yeah, they were. They were quite successful. I mean, they were. They were feared on the open sea. Um, they were. They were like the U-boats. Um, you know, off the coast of America in 19, early 1942 during Operation Dragon. I mean, they were feared. They were sinking, sinking freighters, uh, and taking cargoes and all this kind of stuff, you know, almost, uh, you know, uh, without any, without any problem at all. Uh, they were both captained by, you know, first rate captains. They had very good crews. They knew that, you know, these were people who knew their business and, but there's a fatal flaw in them. And it's the same with, say, the U-boats. These are, the, you, you can't beat someone. You can't beat a country like the, uh, the Union, um, by just taking their stuff. <laughs> you know, I mean, they were taking things like molasses and Chinese tea and, I mean, at one point, um, uh, fireworks for some reason. And, uh, you know, things like that, uh, you know, some, some, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, various, uh, you know, um, foods and, and all this kind of stuff. The problem is, is that th- these are, these are pantry goods. 
I mean, they're they're useful if you want to bring them back to the south and give them out to your people and so on. But there's no way the union is going to surrender just because they've just lost a few hundred gallons of molasses. It's not, it's just not going to happen. Um, this is the the major misconception that they have. So they can they and no, if if Bullock had succeeded in building I don't know twelve of these things and they had been ranging far and wide. Um, all over the place and just rampaging through the union merchant fleets, then that, that, you know, that probably would have put a lot more pressure on union uh, on, uh, on Lincoln. Uh, and that would have fulfilled the plan. But as it was with just two, uh, they couldn't, they, they just simply didn't have the numbers to, to do what they were supposed to do. And the reason why they only had two was because Dudley in Liverpool was making damn sure that he was frustrating Bullock at every turn by then so that's what that's what his main job was he couldn't stop everything but he could stop a lot of it and that was that was the that was the, the key to his success i am um, i specialize in um first world war german commerce traders um and the the german navy had several massive drawbacks with them did the alabama um suffer as well from like um having to constantly source ammunition and then worry about battle damage because like a german cruiser that like the emden if she took any damage there was no way for her to get repaired if she finished up her ammunition that was it she couldn't get any more did the alabama and the florida have a similar sort of problem uh that's a good question no not really uh one reason being is that they they didn't really i mean 98 percent of the time they didn't tangle with warships that could mm-hmm. actually damage them <laughs> they, they took yeah. You know, they, they took, uh, merchant vessels who weren't going to put up much of a fight. So they, they didn't really incur much damage. You know, you get, you get sea damage, you know, just, you know, you get you know, broken masts and you get broken down engines and all this kind of stuff, um, from being at sea for a very long time. Um, but there were, there were any number of friendly ports they could go into. Uh, one of the, one of the biggest for them, the major ones was Nassau. Which was a, you know, British, British owned, but it was, uh, you know, it was a very friendly port for the South. It was a, it was a kind of a, like almost like Switzerland in, in World War II. It was this kind of this hotbed of espionage and dubious dealings and that kind of thing. So they could pull in there and get things repaired without any, without too much of a problem. Um, so, but it didn't, it didn't really happen that often. You know, they yeah. weren't, they weren't fighting very much. No, so it's always the aim to avoid the enemy warships. But every now and then, you accidentally bumble, bumble into one. So I guess they were a bit, they did, they were quite I think lucky. The Alabama, or um, I can't remember which one. Of them, they did actually. It was quite embarrassing for the Union. I think they managed to take a ship full of U.S. Marines uh, who just <laughs> instantly surrendered. But again, these are these are pinpricks. I mean, compared to the, to what to the, to the giant land war that was going on, you know, and that this was part of part of that that bigger scheme you you just it just couldn't topple the union by taking some guys prisoner or you know even sinking a small you know schooner or you know armed schooner it's not going to make that much difference to the war effort okay. um but we end up we have someone called clarence young who turns up and he has a potential to have a huge um effect on the situation doesn't he yeah, uh, the Clarence Young's interesting because he, uh, the, uh, I, w- I, I won't say too much about it, but the reason why Bullock seemed to have this magical ability to know what Dudley was going to do is because he knew what Dudley was going to do. And the reason he knew that was that he had a, again, to use a bit of an anachronism, a mole or an agent, a friend in the foreign office in London. And this friend, would partly he was in, you know, he was in charge of the American desk at the at the end. So he saw all the correspondence between the the uh, between Dudley's um, contacts at the U.S. Embassy in London and the, the Foreign Office. And so he, whenever there was a, a, a you know a raid that was about to happen or anything like that, there was going to be a ins- customs inspection of this so-called merchant ship uh, in Liverpool. You know, he would be able to tip off. Bullock and Bullock would be able to get the ship out, you know, just or manage, manage to clean it up, clean up the crime scene, so to speak, before anyone happened to cross it. Um, Dudley, unbeknownst to Bullock, also has a man inside, um, though, again, it was just an act and he was a walk in. 
Um, and it was a guy called Clarence Young, who's this young fellow that Bullock had recruited and trusted. He was his, essentially his private secretary. Um, and, you know, he had seen all the correspondence that Bullock had made, the secret, the secret stuff that he was mm-hmm. making deals with the, with the shipyards. And it was well known that he was recruiting British subjects into the Confederate Navy, which again, really was breaking the law. And he, that he was, uh, you know, uh, arranging for armaments to be put on board the Florida and the Alabama and so forth when they were out at, in international waters. So it was, it was an, a known conspiracy. Clarence Young, <laughs> Clarence Young is an awful man, but, uh, there's a, you, you kind of feel he's a, bit pitiable at the same time. He uh he was put aboard the Alabama's the purser. Um, you know, just to keep an eye on the money. And of course he, you know, he and he and the captain hate each other. Uh Young is a bit of a spoiled brat. Uh gets drunk all the time, which really didn't go well with Captain Raphael Seams of the Alabama, you know, who who had a no nonsense attitude towards uh uh he had a robust views on law and order at sea, let's put it that way. And, uh, you know, he just dumps Clarence Young in Jamaica. He just leaves him behind one day. He just says, I've had enough. Drums him off the ship. Uh, Young being, uh, you know, <laughs> Young being quite enterprising, uh, manages to kind of hook up with a local woman and together they, they kind of get married. And he, he didn't really bother telling her that there was already a Mrs. Young, but she was in the South somewhere. So there were two Mrs. Youngs around. Uh, and they, he, they go back to Liverpool and he's very, very angry and he blames Bullock for putting him in this mess. And so he dumps the second Mrs. Young in Liverpool. I mean, it wasn't very, very gallant. And he, he tries to sneak aboard a ship going back to America. You see, uh, but he runs out of money. So what he does is he says, you know what? I hate Bullock and I, I, you know, I hate this guy. So I'm going to, I'm going to go to the, the guy who paid me for information. At the U.S. Embassy, he walks into the, the the American Embassy and says, "You know, guys, have I got a secret for you?" <laughs> and this is this is the mother of all secrets, and it's just it's in one of these weird historical coincidences that at that exact moment Dudley arrives from Liverpool carrying a sheaf of papers, tons and tons of sensitive documents, um dealing with all signed by Clarence Young and dealing with this exact same story. It's just, it's just a coincidence. And the reason is, is that the second Mrs. Young, who aggrieved herself, had gone to Dudley and said, would you like all of these papers that Clarence has left behind? So, of course, he buys them. Now, what happens is, is that Clarence just blows the gap. I mean, Clarence Young knows everything about this, about what Bullock has been doing. And so, uh, you know, and he's, he's the key. So at that point, Dudley starts putting together the, the, the biggest legal case and he's going, you know, with Clarence Young as the star witness and they are going to break Bullock once and for all. They're going to expose him. They're going to put him in jail and they're going to put all of his accomplices in jail. This whole thing's going to go down. Um, and it all ends in disaster, but we, that's a whole different subject and you'll, you'll have to buy the book to find out the, uh, the exciting conclusion of that episode. <laughs> I have to say respect to the second wife as well. You know, she's totally. dumped in Liverpool. He's trying to go off on, you know, find another ship and all these things. So I just quite like the fact that she's like, oh, you know, he left these papers here. I might be able to sell them. They're interesting. That's exactly. Yeah, no, she she was a woman who knew her own mind on this one. And she knew that this would, how how much these things were worth. Um, uh, Dudley, by the way, keeps it a secret from Clarence Young because he doesn't quite trust him. I mean, he, even 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 Dudley, who was kind of open eyed about the world in many ways, said, and he rewrites in his diary, you know, I, I think Young is is a bad man. I'm actually quite certain that he's a very bad man, but he is useful. So it's actually an indication that that Dudley was learning how to play the spy game and how to wise up and how to outwit. Bullock. Uh, so it's a kind of a great sort of sea change in his thinking. And so he, you know, but he doesn't tell, there's part of this, he doesn't tell Young that he's already got the papers. And so he, cause he wants to make sure that the guy doesn't run away. <laughs> right. So he also withholds money from him. He, he puts him into safe houses and things like that to keep him away from the Confederates who might very well try and kidnap him and bring him back to the, to the South for, as they say, questioning. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's a, a very a strange, a strange uh, episode. The whole thing. 
And returning to Bullock, um, his most audacious move was to try and build ironclad warships. How did that pan out for him? Um, well, Bullock at some point has to build these warships as part of stage three of the plan. Now, you cannot hide a ironclad ram and claim that it's a civilian ship. You just simply <laughs> can't do it. He has to use a different method to get these out. And so what he comes up with is, is this sort of uh, Byzantine plan uh, involving, it's quite complicated, but in a nutshell, involving this uh, rather dubious French financier who used to be a shoemaker, but made a fortune in Egypt with his, you know, through his contacts with the Pasha, the, the, the Khedive of Egypt, and <laughs> who was a kind of a, an amusing character in his own right. And essentially, it's it's going to, these ships were allegedly commissioned by the Khedive of Egypt for his own Egyptian navy and they were going to be brokered and paid for by this French financier um with and that would leave Bullock out of it Bullock would you know kind of you know keep his name out of it there'd be no papers between him and 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 the shipyard, the shipyard would be selling the ships, so to speak, to the French uh, businessmen who would be selling them on to the Egyptians. So it was all legitimate. You could you could do that. I mean, Egypt was a you know friend of friend of Britain. And it was a you know, and it was a good commission. I mean, you could, and then at the same time, the Chinese emperor was was commissioning a, a small fleet in in Liverpool. It was a fairly you know normal transaction. Uh, of course, it sets off Dudley's alarm bells because he knows that there's something going on, but he can't pierce this carapace of of silence. It's very, very t- difficult to break into this. Um, so it's a kind of a complicated story. It's a, it's a very interesting one about how Dudley then manages to gather the evidence and then, on top of that, persuade the uh, the, the, the British government to act on this and to shut down this operation once and for all. And so that that's the sort of the conclusion of the book. But it's a it's a it's a fantastic story about this whole very questionable uh, a bit of arms dealing here and there. But it, essentially, it, it uh, you know it, it 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 that's what hangs Bullock in the end. Mm. I mean, not literally, but uh, I mean, they're all gentlemen <laughs> about it. Nobody gets hanged in this, but uh, <laughs> it essentially ends ends the operation in many ways. Originally, I was going to ask. Um how what happens to the key players because it's, it's so interesting but i think people should go away and read this book because it is genuinely i, I don't it's not often that i pick up a book that i can't put down and uh, literally for the last two weeks i've been reading this book continually and it's fantastic so alex would you mind telling us again the title of your book uh the title of the book is the lion and the fox two rival spies and the secret plot to build a confederate navy but it's uh you know I built I I designed it as a well designed it I wrote it as a as a quick easy kind of thrilling read. Also, Alex, uh, where else could if people are interested in your work and what projects you're working on and things you have worked on, where where else can they find you on the internet? Um, yeah, I run a small uh, free newsletter on Substack called Spionage, which deals with sort of you know old world spying and historical intelligence, you know stuff that interests me from ancient Assyria up to sort of World War II, uh, the 1950s. Um, and, and there's also my website, which is www.alexrose.com. And, you know, I put all the stuff about my books there. And, and uh, you know, there's a I have a Twitter as well, which I occasionally deal with. Um, so, yeah, it's easy to pretty easy to find me. Thanks ever so much for coming on to uh, the first of this as yet unnamed uh, Naval History Podcast for History Hack. It's been it's been a really interesting subject to look at. and. Uh, I know I've said it several times before, but please go and buy the book. It's fantastic. <laughs> and uh, thanks to Beth as well for coming along. No, thanks for the invite. And thanks, Alex. That was a really interesting episode. Our incredible guests give us 45 minutes of their time to join us and talk about their work or their new book. This is just a small taster. As a result, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest books. You can support them and you can support us on History Hack. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep going and bring you more top-of-the-line guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack 
or search for us in the shop section. Thank you so much for your continued support. We really appreciate our listeners and supporters. So make sure you get down to the bookshop and grab yourselves a new book.